Hello, I'm Steve. A little about myself. I'm a retired law enforcement officer with 20 years of service. I began my career in the jail, worked the road, and became an investigator. During my career, my training consisted of everything from SWAT to becoming a state certified crime scene technician. I've investigated crimes from thefts to homicides. After retiring and becoming aware of true crime and web sleuths, I started my channel for web sleuths to better understand the perspectives of law enforcement. Not only do we cover true crime, I go out into the field and assist families who have lost loved ones to homicide and their cases are considered cold. Join me as we look and bring attention to these critical cases. Hello, everyone. Glad you're able to join us tonight. Uh, if you're new to the channel, we want to welcome you. And uh, let's see if I can get this thing. Um, but uh, as always, with people, whenever you come into our channel and you come in to chat, what will happen is that we'll have us a, uh, a presentation, after which um, I'll answer all your questions. And then, of course, uh, we'll be talking about the uh, uh, Springfield 3 tonight, um, which I just uh, became involved in, in looking at the case recently. And it's an absolutely amazing case. And uh, one of the interesting aspects of it is that we get to look at this case and try to determine, as we often see with a lot of these cases, that when you have multiple victims, how does law enforcement determine who is the target? Because that plays a large part in the investigation for them to be able to follow up and go down the right path. Because during your victimology of each of the victims, when you have multiple ones, um, if you go down the wrong uh, trail, then of course it will run cold or, and you will uh, be chasing after the wrong suspect. Um, and in this case, there's several suspects and information regarding a lot of things that were going on. But tonight we're just going to be covering uh, one suspect plus the uh, phone calls. And there we go. Got it going. Um, my screen was messed up there for a minute, guys. Appreciate you bearing with me. Um, but uh, like I said, law enforcement has a tough job uh, as the web sleuths look at it you know it's easy for us to go in and just determine that oh this is who i believe it is well law enforcement doesn't have that luxury they have to look at a lot of different things that occur and try to determine is there staging going on to mislead them down a certain path and to pursue a certain individual and uh, sometimes it exists sometimes it doesn't and so it's it, it's a very complicated uh, uh, part of the investigation and there's so many key parts that play in it you know when we have people that are missing uh, versus a homicide what does that mean um, as in this case if it was just that someone was out to commit homicides on three females or on a female in a residence um, they had privacy within that residence and they could have completed any task they wanted to within that residence. But that wasn't the case. There was something that made them, and is it part of their fantasy, or was there a reason that they had to separate themselves from this residence and take them somewhere? And any time you go in and commit such a crime that you take individuals from the residence, you have to have a place that you can take them, that you can um, have control of them, conceal them, whatever their fantasy is um, uh, and that uh, and they do it during certain time periods um, so that uh, the exposures and the dangers of being caught uh, are minimized and that's all part of their mo and we see this uh, quite uh, frequently even in a recent case there's a lot of similarities from what happened uh, three uh, uh, decades ago and what was a re recent case in idaho uh, with uh, uh, the uh, Idaho 4 homicides. You know, we have multiple victims inside a home, whereas they were, the homicides all occurred in that one residence. No one was taken from the residence. Now, we don't know if that was, uh, uh, was there going to be or was it a failed abduction? And we just don't know all the things about the Idaho 4. But in this case, we know that there didn't appear to be any type of struggle within the residence. Um, and we know of some uh, information as far as the answer machine. But we're going to get into it now. So if you'll give me the presentation.
All right. Of course, this is the um, um, the Springfield three. Uh, Cheryl Levitt, uh, Suzanne Street, who is the daughter of uh, uh, Cheryl, and their uh, Suzanne's friend Stacy McCall. And when their friend came over the next day after they were reported missing, um, that on June the seventh, nineteen ninety-two, when um, uh, they came, everything appeared to be in order. Uh, personal belongings there, cars, purses, everything's left behind. No signs of a struggle. There was a broken porch light uh, globe, which is extremely interesting. And there's several reasons of possibilities of why that globe was broken. Um, was it some type of diversion to get the door unlocked where they might try to come out and clean it up? And um, just don't know. Uh, as I proceed in, um, in the investigations, and if I can get in touch with some uh, people that uh, have far greater knowledge than I, because I've only started on it in the last few days, um, and possibly even get to talk to some of the uh, uh, former law enforcement if they'll uh, share. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to have some a little bit better understanding of some of the things that went on. But uh, and uh, but there was one particular thing um, that was noted that um, on the answering machine within the residence. Um, there was, uh, that might have provided a clue about the, uh, uh, disappearances. And I don't know that much about the message. I don't know how much has been released out there. I can't find it yet, but hopefully, um, um, it, it may or may not be something that law enforcement is holding close to the chest, but, um, it is absolutely, um, unbelievable. And I hate it that it was inadvertently erased. How many times was it listened to? Who listened to it? What time was the call put, placed and left on the machine? Did the machine have the technology to tell the time of when it was came in? Was it a message that was left pre-abduction or was it a message that was left post-abduction? All of that will play part. Um, as you can see here from where the residence is located, it's near a busy street, uh, uh, surrounded by residences. And, and that was one of the things that was very interesting about breaking glass. Um, and also, how can you control going in? Now, I know there's a lot of different ways that once you're inside of a residence to be able to go in there and subdue people and also make sure that they're not uh, capable of, or have the ability to scream or alert neighbors. And even with that, uh, those methods being used, there's still no reason to take them from the residence unless there's a purpose. And uh, because like I said, if it's just a homicide or some type of fantasy that you wish uh, for them to fulfill whatever uh, uh, fantasy they had involving which one of these girls or the mother that was uh, the target. Um, it was something that absolutely could have been done at this residence, but if it was more involved and the fantasy was, uh, uh, and they needed separation, um, to fulfill uh, whatever it was, then um, it, it's very interesting that they were able to control three and take them all, and no one was the wiser in the neighborhood. And um, how could that be uh, done? And was it done by one offender or multiple offenders? And uh, of course, as you see, the uh, front of the residence, it's nothing uh, that uh, out of the way, it's a, a well kept, uh, maintained residence. Uh, small port, small residence. But uh, the following day when the uh, friend came over and uh, because uh, the two of the uh, Suzanne and Stacy had failed to show up to meet the friend so they'd go to a water park, uh, they went and found that the uh, front door was unlocked and they entered and um, a vehicle was there and everything was in order. And of course they saw that the porch light was shot, uh, shattered and it says here that the light bulb itself was intact. Um, but they swept up the glass and um, and said, and law enforcement said they may have uh, destroyed potential evidence. Now we're talking about 1992. What type of evidence could they have destroyed? Of course, fingerprints um, may have uh, disturbed or cross-contaminated or uh, uh, complicated the uh, DNA touch uh, uh, profiles that we can now uh, acquire, but back then uh, DNA was in the early stages and they uh, didn't have all the uh, um, 
advances that we have now and able to. I'm hoping they still have this glass and maybe they will go back um, and uh, process it. I don't know. Hadn't got that far into the investigation yet. Um, I will be going out to um, uh, Missouri uh, at some point. I've got to go to Texas in um, May and I may stop back by on the way back home. But um, anyway, we're going to go out there and uh, and I'm at some point, I just don't know exactly if it's going to be May, June or July, but I, I'm looking forward to getting out there and speaking to some of the locals and seeing um, what information we can gather. But uh, just as with the Idaho Ford, there was a dog in the resident that was left unharmed. And it's strange. And like I said, a lot of um, um, similarities of how these offenders, regardless of what generation they come from, how they uh, interact and what they do at these residences as far as timelines, entries of homes. Uh, we could see it with uh, BTK. You saw it uh, uh, with the uh, Golden State uh, uh, killer. Bundy, of course, he, he worked day and night, but uh, uh, some of the other offenders uh, chose to work at night. And we have an offender in this case that uh, we'll be looking at shortly that uh, um, absolutely is um, um, a suspect that is worthy of looking at. But uh, while the uh, friend was there that had discovered that the house uh, uh, was unlocked and that there was nothing out of order other than that she couldn't locate anybody, that she received a very um, strange phone call and of a uh, with sexual innuendos. And, um, and so she hung up and, of course, um, and received another one. And we have to understand that this is at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, the other night when we were um, talking about this on our first um, uh, speech and, uh, and, and process of looking at this case, I asked all the people in chat, and uh, particularly the females, how often did you throughout your life receive um, such types of phone calls at nine o'clock in the morning? And, um, and then chat, if you want to, you can post what time, but most all of them were later in the afternoons or late at night. And um, all the reports I normally took in my career were the same. They were from supper time later um, up until waking them up in the early morning hours. And, you know, midnight, one o'clock. But um, I don't think in my career I ever once took a, a uh, any type of harassed phone call as far as this type of nature of uh, uh, of anyone making that type of a sexual advance. But um, the old uh, cell phones, I went and found an old uh, picture of a uh, some of the old uh, uh, answering machines pre-cell phone where... Um, and some of these answer machines, I don't know, I typed in 1992 vintage um, answer machines, and this popped up. I don't know if it's from that era or not. And I may even have one or two probably uh, somewhere in some storage somewhere. But um, I found this picture, and and, um, and this is uh, absolutely, uh, Bell South was probably in the 80s and for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, But um, the... Um, I also found where there were some of the answering machines that were dual cassettes. And for the younger generations that don't understand what cassettes were, they, they're just a, a type of a tape. That's all it was. It was just regular audio tape. And um, um, you had cassettes and dual cassettes. And But um, I found it interesting that whoever was operating this machine inadvertently um, erased that message, which is, um, interesting for the fact that law enforcement said that the message on the machine they thought was related. The phone calls that were to the friend that discovered everyone missing, they didn't feel was related. Was it because that, that uh, uh, witness was able to listen to the call and say, no, that's not the same voice? And can you jump to that conclusion when you have three different individuals missing that there would only be one offender? And was that phone call made for a, a lot of different reasons? Was it part of the staging or was it any staging? Um, and when was it left? And did she, uh, who had listened to those uh, calls uh, after the discovery of them missing, was she able to determine, no, that's not the same voice? 
And uh, so um, as we go forth with it, we'll be looking at that. Now, law enforcement currently, and um, some of this information about uh, when these other people and these other suspects come into the picture, because like I said, law enforcement would do a victimology, even back in the 90s, of, uh, of the victims and try to find out uh, what was going on in their lives because it's always has been and always will be that more than likely if you're the victim of a homicide, it's going to be by someone that knows you and someone that you know, but most definitely by someone that knows you far more because there are certain individuals that um, have a relationship with you that you don't know about. Uh, they, they live in a fantasy world. And they uh, and they pursue uh, their victims. They stalk their victims, and you may never know about it. But um, and uh, and that's the dangers of some of these individuals and these psychopaths that are out there on the streets. Um, you know these serial offenders, BTK. Like I said, he he had multiple victims targeted at any one time. Um, and then of course uh, the uh, Golden State uh, Killer, uh, similar that he had uh, tra he'd travel across uh, certain areas and regions and uh, would attack in the uh, early morning hours and gain absolute control. But uh, I separated these victims um, into two categories. We have the ones where you look at that if Cheryl or Susan, mother and daughter, were the targets because they had that disturbing phone call uh, message on the answer machine, were there others that had occurred prior? Were there reports uh, that they may have filed? Because whoever was making this phone call knew the number and was able to make that phone call, not only to leave the message, but we have another potential co-offender or a coincidence of someone in a fantasy world making uh, these uh, sexual advances. Um, and possibly watching the home if he was involved as a co-offender for the fact that 9 a.m., just by coincidence, when the people come in to look and discover that the house is vacant and are, you know, anxious that they receive such a uh, type of phone call. Very interesting. And is it by coincidence or is it by someone just like we see in recent with the Idaho 4 that uh, Koberger, the next morning after committing those crimes at two to three o'clock in the morning, what did he do? He got up the next morning, went back to the residence or went past the residence. Um, and was this offender doing the same thing? But back then we didn't have the technologies, although there were some cell phones out there and, um, uh, but the tracking technologies was far less than what it is now. And did he go to a pay phone to make those phone calls after he saw someone enter? Law enforcement would look at that and they'd be trying to determine it. And like I said, law enforcement for some reason separated the two. But if we're looking at it, that uh, these phone calls are related to the homicides. And of course, the target ear has to be Cheryl or Susan, Suzanne. And we can break it down further that if it was Cheryl, the mother, uh, who was the target and she was under any type of surveillance and, um, if the offender had seen her that night and was making phone call that he could have come any time prior to Suzanne and Stacy coming uh, to the residence and possibly just taking her. And then Suzanne and Stacy would have come home and wouldn't have known or been any the wiser. And so we have to look at now, does that mean that Suzanne was the target? Uh, because we have this disturbing phone call that law enforcement says, uh, had some type of key information indicating that they were con it was very concerning. But then we look at um, what if Stacy is the target? What do we have to work with with that? Well, we have this uh, career criminal, uh, uh, Cox here, uh, who is serving time in Texas currently, been on death row in uh, California, which we'll look at uh, shortly. But he worked with Stacy's father. He has a history of uh, assaulting women. Um, now, there's no evidence that he ever had any interactions, but it doesn't mean that Stacy may have not had any uh, knowledge of interactions. Doesn't mean that Cox didn't have interactions. 
um, for the fact, like I said, sometimes during that process of stalking, just like with BTK's victims, they didn't know. They never realized they were being stalked. Um, and that uh, the girlfriend of this individual asked for an alibi to be created. And it would be extremely interesting at what time frame did she, did he ask her, when do, uh, when was that alibi to be created? And uh, as I look further into it, I hope they get that information. And if anyone out there has some of this information, send me an email. Absolutely. Um, I'd appreciate it. But he has that criminal history. And during an interview uh, with, I believe it was a reporter, he advised that he knew that they are dead and they would never be found. And that he will, uh, uh, after his mother dies, that he will tell. And if this is the case, then Stacy would be the target. But if Stacy is the target, then that means that the phone calls at the residence, and that's how come I've got these broken up, that you wouldn't be able to be leaving these type of uh, critical, disturbing phone call that law enforcement put a lot of weight on if Stacy is a target. It would have been her residence and her phone that he would have been knowledgeable about. Now, there is a chance that if that phone call came in and we don't know exactly what time it came in currently, I don't, y'all may know, but uh, if it was after the abduction, then of course he could have forced any of the three ladies to uh, give that number up and uh, make that contact and leave a disturbing message. Uh, and that's like I say, I'm just speculating on that because I don't know the time frame of when that message was left. I only know that it was listened to and it was disturbing. And this is the hard part for law enforcement to uh, determine that they may go down the path of the answering machine. And I want each of you to think about that, that, you know, it's easy to look and read and, and jump on board with what podcasters or uh, the news media and uh, these individuals, when they speak, to jump on that train. Um, it's, but once you jump on that train, you're on those tracks running to the end of the uh, a railhead and wherever it takes you, that's where it takes you. It's a, well, you know, basically a very uh, narrow course that you will go when you start down these paths because there's not enough resources for law enforcement to go in there and um, look at all these suspects at uh, the same time. Um, it's getting easier now because we formed the task force and they, uh, they jump and work together now. But um, it, it, it would be extremely interesting to see uh, what all went on. But, um, of course, here's uh, Cheryl Levitt and um, uh, Suzanne Streeter. If you have any information about this case, make sure law enforcement has it. And that's the reason we bring awareness to these cases so that if there's someone out there listening to this, that if something clicks in your mind, if you were in the area at the time and you had friends that were receiving those phone calls, and um, make sure law enforcement knows about that because there is a great possibility that, whoever's making those disturbing phone calls, they have other victims. It's not just these um, uh, or this one phone number. Um, and also, if they're related with the morning call, um, then, uh, like I said, they would be other victims out there. So if anyone that lives in the area, um, as you look at this case and you talk about it and ask people about that, uh, who, are, who were in the area at the time, and because... It's absolutely uh, critical for people to reflect. And we only have a few years, you know, it's, it's uh, been 30 years now. And uh, our witnesses are, um, you know, more and more, um, there's less and less living witnesses uh, now than there were uh, five years ago. And that's going to continue. So we need to make sure that we talk to everybody we can out there and try to bring awareness to it as much as possible. And then, of course, we have Robert Cox here again. And um, but he was uh, prior to coming back to Missouri when this case started, he was staying at a hotel in Florida uh, where a, uh, a victim of a homicide was found. And of course, he was charged and convicted. And um, and then for whatever reason, the Supreme Court of Florida threw out it uh, because they said they looked at it and said there was insufficient grounds. Uh, uh, for him to be found guilty. Um, jury didn't think so, but uh, court system's court system. Um, and then he was returned to California 
where he had been serving sentence there for kidnapping and assaulting two women. So we know that he has the ability and has a history of kidnapping and assaulting um, more than one. And, um, you know, and so he has that history. And then, of course, when he went to Texas, um, he uh, uh, armed robbery and now he's serving life with no possibility of parole for 30 years, which is great. Um, but um, when he moved to Springfield and he started working with the father of one of the victims, it does lead one to, um, I can see why people would go down that path. And uh, I, you know, we have to look at others because there's other suspects also with other information and everybody has uh, their opinion right now. I don't, um, I've still got to collect and I won't uh, be developing just a single, but I wanted to bring up this one specific one of, of Robert Cox for the fact that um, when he moved to Springfield and when he worked with Stacy McCall's father, of course, uh, law enforcement is going to be looking at him. And then when you have that alibi that was created and then he comes out and makes those statements. Now, those statements could be made by some inmate that was wanting special treatment because that's a lot of things we have seen uh, where other inmates serving life or even on death row, they will come out and make wild claims so that they can get some attention and get special treatments. And uh, is that the case with this? Don't know yet. But uh, he did work with her father, uh, Stacy. And of course, if you have any information with, about her, uh, absolutely make sure law enforcement knows that information. And, um, but uh, this is just some information about what uh, Cox did in Florida and how close he was. Uh, uh, he was in the uh, motel that was close to the grove where uh, his victim in uh, Florida uh, was found, uh, uh, the victim of a homicide. And in that case, uh, uh, went unsolved for a decade. But uh, when they brought him back, they were able to get a conviction against him. And then it was overturned. And uh, that's where we stand at today. But anyway, I wanted to bring up this information more to bring focus to the case that it is active. There's possibility there's an offender still out there that if it's not this individual and what drove law enforcement to go with the disturbing message. And some people and some uh, have already said that law enforcement cleared um, uh, Cox. But um, I watched uh, a couple and read a couple articles that no one has been cleared, including Cox yet. So there's always going to be different viewpoints and opinions and uh, which way uh, is it going to go. But uh, the main focus of this was just to bring attention to the case and to let people see that law enforcement sometimes is a hard uh, choice of which way they're going to take this. And if they take the, the wrong path, early on, it can lead to a cold case uh, such as this for uh, many, many years. All right. You ready? Yep. Okay. Uh, from D. Mead, is there any way that they can retrieve the message that was erased? I, I don't know if, if it was some type of digital um, uh, uh, recorder or if it was you would think if it was the old uh, tape that they might be able to reco recover it and I'm sure they tried um, I just don't have any uh, idea if they've ever recovered it or has technology got to the point that they could all right and I'm going to jump down and Molly says I believe Cheryl had a digital answering machine it looked like one we had yes and um and that's the thing that would have no tape that would have no tape okay but okay. you know there's still the possibility that we have uh, better technologies now that maybe they could go back in and look at it i don't know and have they i'm pretty sure i would i would hope they have <laughs> i have no knowledge of it but i would hope they have all right and josh deposh no bodies were ever found right you're correct josh and uh, he said they would never be found and that he will tell after his mom dies. I looked up to see if his mother had deceased or was deceased, and um, I hadn't found any information on her yet. 
And JJ wants to know if this guy is still alive. Last I heard, um, he's still serving time in Texas. I'd like to go out and talk to him. <laughs> and Grumpy Cat, I'm guessing that mugshot is Robert Craig Cox. It is. Um, I've got it um, right there. All right. He's aged, and a, sure. a prison hasn't been kind to him. Good. And Joan, someone in the neighborhood who had a visual on the house, easier to control three for a short distance. They could be lured under the idea a neighbor needed help. Um, any bloodhound juice? I don't know. Um, it being in the area, it would be highly unlikely, um, although it is possible that they could have been led a short distance, but there was a green van that was spotted and uh, a conversation heard by a witness. We'll get later into another show about it. But um, um, in that type of neighborhood, typically uh, they're going to, you know, there has to be some type of restraint because a single individual, uh, if you don't have them uh, some type of uh, muffle or they're unconscious um, and restrained, it's very, very hard uh, to keep them uh, quiet that uh, the neighbors wouldn't be alerted. All right. And Sarah at True Crime Web, don't these people understand that they will spend days, years with no life before they do this? Or do they just realize after committing? <laughs> They're driven uh, by whatever... Um, fantasy um and they're narcissistic uh, a lot of these offenders that they're smarter than everybody um it's all about them and it has nothing to do with you um uh, uh, your feelings your thoughts uh your opinions that serves no purpose in their life that uh it's all about whatever feeds their fantasy and um once they go to prison then of course um they probably still look back and they uh, live upon those fantasies and they, they want people to talk to them so they can relive these cases uh, through those memories and, um, and, and speak of people so that they can show how powerful they were. And Molly, um, at True Crime Web, Stacy did visit her father from time to time at the dealership, so he could have seen her there. But he would have had, but he would have had to have been following her all night to find her at Susie's. Yes, I mean he may have overheard uh, Susie talking with her father. I'm going to be at a uh, graduation party, um, and um, and he may have been able. Um, uh, to find out where that was and uh, crash the party. We, there's so many abilities of these offenders and these predators of how they get focused and how they get information. We're talking about a time of when, um, you know, people get docs now, but back then everybody got docs by the uh, phone book. You, know, you, you had their phone number, you knew um, where uh, either it was, a male name in the phone book or it was a female name in the phone book and their listings and their addresses. And, um, uh, of course you could pay more to be unlisted, but, um, and the uh, dangers from that. And like I said, we don't know, um, you know, what job that, uh, uh, Cox had during uh, this and how close and what conversations he could have heard, uh, Stacy's father, uh, speaking about where, uh, telling Stacy's mother where uh, uh, she was going to be that night, and um, as far as what party, and maybe tracked her from there, or that she was going to spend a night at uh, Susie's. But uh, and that's where the uh, uh, the separation of the phone number and uh, Stacy means you have to go one or the other because there is two different residences. And Dave reminded us that they had um, information that you could call to get phone numbers. Yes. Remember? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Back in the day. 
And how mad do we get at people now for giving us give people numbers that we don't want them to have? And the Bible group. Steve, do you think wickedness is genetic, environmental, spiritual, or a combination? Combination. Um, I, you know, you see some of these children that live in the absolute, they're, they may be adopted. And, um, and they, the adoptive parents give these children everything they would ever need. Um, and they're in a uh, environment um, that uh, is uh, nourishing and, and, uh, and where the parents cherish them. And they still, at some point, will bite the hand or commit a homicide of the hand that fed them and treated them. So uh, there's a lot of different things that make people uh, take that path. And um, I have no idea what the combination is. And if we did, uh, uh, we would absolutely be able to uh, control some of it. But uh, I think it's just a combination of all. Good question. All right. And Sean, could they be in a vehicle underwater in a body of water, a river or lake? Was any body of water search? Um, I'm sure they, they were, but, and they would, law enforcement would look for vehicles that were missing at that time, but they were looking for a green van and they've never found that green van. So I see where you're going with that. And, uh, is that a possibility? Absolutely. Um, and because if the victims were in that green van, that's a part of each of these flyers, then, um, um, uh, they may very well have uh, done such a thing as what you uh, uh, imply. Okay. And Gail, do you think multiple perpetrators? Control three and carry three, I would uh, uh, tend to believe there, there was, uh, that he would either, because uh, Susie and um, Stacy were probably staying in the same uh, room. Um, and for him to, for one offender to go in there, we have to have absolute control. Could you do that with a firearm? Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, you wake one and threaten them that if you um, shout, um, you know, I'll do whatever I have to do to make sure that, you know, and some people succumb to that type of uh, threats and they remain quiet and don't fight. And then it gets to the point where they're at uh, under the total control. Um, is that what occurred? It's possible. And but it 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 is so rare to have one offender that can do that much uh, damage. But we have a, a recent case with Kohlberger where he went in and committed. Um, he what he didn't abduct four of them from the residence, but he was able to commit four homicides in one residence. And Kamala gets blue light. My blue light's not working. It's not? Yeah, it is. Oh, there it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, she says, back in 81, 82, I had a dude that would call and only ask me only when I was home. Um, and so you have to look at how did he have line of sight and knowledge of you? Because that's pre <laughs> all the tracking data that we have now and that technology. So, uh, yes, that's going to be someone within... Uh, your circle of um, and uh, that had a line of sight or followed you or, uh, or knew your daily. And if you said only, then that means that uh, your schedule uh, was. Uh, yeah, well, no, I mean that uh, if she had changed her schedule and then she came in at a different time and he showed up or called. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 He knew, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, knew he knew your schedule and knew where you lived. That's no doubt. Well known. Yep. All right. And Sarah at True Crime Web, what do they think they will gain after committing crimes? To me, they gain nothing but negativity. Oh, it has nothing to do. What um, Now, they're fulfilling their fantasy. Um, I'll get with Dr. Susan at some point about this case, because I think that would be very interesting uh, to talk about this, um, particularly for the fact that these people, whatever their fantasies are, um, it just it it feeds 
whatever it is that's in that individual to commit these crimes. Ted Bundy, you know, he, he was driven and he took great risks, you know, uh, even that one time where he went to the beach twice and abducted and tricked those two girls to leave with him and, and uh, commit those homicides that, in the same day on a crowded beach. And is that part of their fantasy? And it's feeding that, you know, just like all of us, we, we have a thirst for water. So we go get a drink of water. We have a thirst for or, or a hunger for food and we would go get food. Well, these individuals, uh, whatever that fantasy is, they're going to feed it at all costs. And some of them, and well, all of them do. And it's absolutely horrible, uh, uh, of what those victims have to go through. And Molly Molly at True Crime Web, like Evansdale slash Delphi being rare, two victims at the same time. Are there other known instances of three? I'm sure there is. I just can't uh, think of them. Um, you know, the Golden State now, BTK went in houses uh, at some times and he uh, would, uh, I think the first family, I think there were four victims, uh, two survivors that came in after school hours, I believe, but there were four victims to start with. Um, and so, yes, you have these offenders at will and then you have them where um, they may take twos, but three is, would be extremely hard for any single offender to, uh, be able to control and get them out of the residence by themselves uh, would be um, extremely difficult. But three, yeah, that is odd. All right, Grumpy Cat. Hi, Mr. Steve. I heard the Springfield police had thousands of tips. Would they be willing to share their tips with you, <laughs> and would it be helpful? Um, I doubt they'll be willing to share them with me, but uh, I will uh, – uh, tried to talk to some of the uh, retired officers and and there's a lot of investigators uh, in the uh, true crime world that have uh, accumulated a vast knowledge and uh, information on this case and and I believe it was pretty well publicized and they were even criticized about how much information they let out for the fact that they thought it would um, be detrimental to the case um, and as I go through that I'm looking forward to that and Hopefully I can get in touch with that. And uh, uh, Chris and I are going to be uh, looking at this case because there, we do have the ability of completing and doing some um, search of an area that was searched by ground penetrating radar by a reporter and a professional uh, scientist that did that type of work and found some anomalies in a uh, near uh, uh, hospital or bank and uh, and so we're going to see if uh, I can um, contact them and see if they're willing to have another scientist come in and um, uh, look at that property okay and Josh the posh the only pos the only possible sign of struggle was a broken porch light cover question mark could that be where the point of abduction, abduction took place? It could be that that was part of the ploy to get someone out of the residence to unlock the door because if the girls came home and they went in and locked the door, was it was that light broken on purpose, create a uh, scene, whereas they would open the door and, and possibly see the glass and uh, come out to clean it up or something, and that is where the first uh, contact and where the first... Uh, um, um, uh, were for, forced back into the residence to gain control. Um, don't know if that's the case, but that is a possibility because some of these offenders will create ploys. Although it's very risky to be breaking glass and making noises um, because you don't know uh, how uh, neighbors react. You don't know how homeowners within the home and what's in there, how they react. So, and there's also the possibility um, that um, whenever um, Suzanne, Suzanne and Stacy came home, that uh, Cheryl may have already been under the control of the offender. Uh, it doesn't mean that the offender came in um, later. Um, he may have already been there. 
And so they would look at that and see if that is the case um, because there could be a lot of different uh, possibilities of how that crime went down. And Deborah, um, Steve, could the porch light been knocked out so they would be in the darkness? True, uh, it could, but you know, most of them are, um, you, you know, you just turn the light switch off. Um, but um, yeah, there's a, and I don't know the total reason of why it was uh, broke, but it is strange because like I said, it's breaking glass does create a noise. And what was the purpose of that? Uh, was it, was that part of the a, a struggle? Um, but I don't think anyone noted any type of screams or anything of that nature that night that I know of currently. And Deborah, did they have tasers back then? Let's see, in 92, um, yes, they had um, handheld ones. Um, um, and I know that for a fact, I was, uh, we had a couple officers Mrs. Steve, get, I, I've been tased probably 40 or 50 times in my career. Um, and, um, but uh, uh, yes, they did have them. I think the original tasers, first ones I saw in the late 80s, uh, handheld ones. All right. So now let me cruise here. Um... They didn't have the tasers that shot the uh, prongs, uh, but they did just have the handheld contact ones. Nick, can you just put up there and, and help? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Um, all right. So I'm going to, I have no more questions on this one. I have two. I, well, actually, this one, I guess, is Lisa says, I listened to Paper Ghost about 1992, Tammy. Zywicki and they said serial killer suspect in the Springfield three. Have you read that? No, I haven't, but thank you. All right. And if for anyone that does have information on this case uh, that you want to share with me or, or, or an opinion of it, absolutely do. I'm open to all opinions. I, I'm not going to form a bias uh, yet. I've got to go out there. Um, I have um, some people that's been sending me some emails and some information about uh, phone books and things. And thank you for doing that. Appreciate that. Um, and um, uh, going to libraries and things. And um, I'm looking forward to going out there and, like I said, getting a little bit more information firsthand. All right. And from Molly, the only thing I've seen about sounds was the dog being in a neighbor's yard at 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. barking and wanting in the neighbor's house dog got out a lot apparently i don't know of doggy door and that's a, a weakness about doggy doors <laughs> i've seen a lot of bad things happen because of doggy doors and i don't know if uh if that's the case okay here and from molly there's two or three other sks named regarding this case both in prison currently oh yes and that and that's the thing there's so many and when you have that many uh, law enforcement uh like i said they have to choose certain paths um initially and um and when did these others become uh, a part of the investigations and what uh where will it lead i just don't know yet and then <clears throat> I have one question that's off topic Sure. from Deborah. Has anyone heard about Sarah Dyer from Florida that's missing, 38-year-old? I, um, um, yes, I, I heard about it, but I, um, I haven't uh, looked into it yet. Okay. And let's see here. Um, all right. And Daniel, Steve, do you think it was the plan to abduct all three of them or maybe he had to change his plan on the fly? Well, that's it. If, if the mother, Cheryl, Cheryl was the intended target and if he was already in the house, then he could have just took her. Um, and, but uh, if he came after they arrived at two o'clock in the morning, and it was one of the other girls that were the targets. And then he took all three of them. Um, and typically, 
It doesn't matter if it's law enforcement or if it's crimes. All your plans uh, typically go bad within the first three or four moves you make. Uh, it, it's just human nature. Because when you start have, having interactions with victims, you have fight or flight. And, um, and they can have a great impact on what happens from that point on. Um, but I find it so interesting that it's just not a homicide uh, for the fact that there's some of the motives that have been mentioned that certain things were going to occur. And if you just need to make sure someone doesn't testify, creating a homicide is very, very simple. Um, and the steps needed for that is um, you don't have to transport. You don't have to put that, put yourself at risk of discovery or a plan going back. But in this case, they were removed and they were taken somewhere. And why? And, um, you know, there's a lot of different motives for why, but uh, uh, we just don't know those. Won't know that until the uh, until they're found. All right, you are you are done. All righty, guys. I want to thank everyone that uh, as we get ready and we're counting down to start uh, uh, our travels with Chris and going out working cold cases. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody that's contributed to the uh, True Crime Web Foundation. It's absolutely amazing. Um, that allows us to do this. Everyone that's contributed to our uh, um, PayPal, contributed to through YouTube, Super Chats, um, members, uh, absolutely amazing because uh, we got a busy year ahead of us. Uh, we're going to be going on the road now that the snowpack is uh, uh, easing up uh, in the Northwest. We've got some cases out there to go. And of course, I got to go back up to uh, Iowa um, with Lyric and Elizabeth. And um, hopefully everything goes well in uh, Texas on Amber Crumb uh, starting May the 2nd. And, um, but, uh, we're going to be on the road in May, uh, June, July, <laughs> probably August. So, uh, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, we couldn't do it without y'all. Um, and we're going to try to work as hard as we can, uh, for these families to have the impact. And, uh, but y'all stay safe out there, be aware of your surroundings. And if you know anything about any of these cases or any case, uh, regardless of where you're at on. Um, some type of cold case you're looking at make sure law enforcement has that information but uh, appreciate y'all being here tonight y'all stay safe and we'll see y'all soon you leave it on that? um all right love y'all yeah hold on a second okay there we go all right. nope. one more okay miss kamala Advice I was given, never let first location, you would rather be shot than get to the second location. Yes, second location never works out for you. Uh, right. Make sure everything works out or do whatever has to be done at that first location. That is it. Very, Thank you so much. Very few people will return from the second location. You've told me that for how many years? <laughs> 33. There you go. There you go. All right. Love y'all. Take care. <laughs>